Okay, I'm going to be reading some of St. Augustine's works. Um, I'll start with an introduction. Uh, author, Augustine of Hippo, this is from Wikisource. Augustine of Hippo, 354 to 430 AD. So Augustine of Hippo, or St. Augustine, is one of the most important figures in the development of Western Christianity. In Roman Catholicism, he is a saint and preeminent doctor of the church, and the patron of the Augustine religion, and a patron of the Augustine religion, Augustinian religious order. Many Protestants, especially Calvinists, consider him to be one of the theological fountainheads of Reformation teaching on salvation and grace. He is also officially considered a saint by the Orthodox Church. Born in Africa as the eldest son of St. Monica, he was educated in Rome and baptized in Milan. His works, including the Confessions, which is often called the first Western autobiography, are still read around the world. Here's a portrait of him, Augustine of Hippo. Alright, so we're going to start with the City of God. Um, Ni Nicene and Post Nicene Fathers Series 1, Volume 2, City of God. Nicene and Post Nicene Fathers Series 1, Philip Schaff et al., translated by Marcus Dodds, Volume 2, City of God. City of God, translated by Reverend Marcus Dodds, DD, which means Doctor of Divinity. Here, read the translator's preface. Rome, having been stormed and sacked by the Goths under Alaric their king, the worshippers of false gods or pagans, as we commonly call them. Let me just do this. Translator's preface. Rome having been stormed and sacked by the Goths under Alaric their king, the worshippers of false gods or pagans, as we commonly call them, made an attempt to attribute this calamity to the Christian religion, having and began to and begin to blaspheme the true God with even more than their wanted bitterness and acerbity. I mean I gotta look that word up. Does it mean like bitter acerbity? Sharpness and directness in speech. The relationship was built on a certain mutual acerbity. Okay, I built the quality of being a serb bake. Well, that doesn't really help. Uh, synonyms and acronyms. Synonyms, bite, bitterness, sharpness, keenness, acuteness. Okay, well, it's related to taste. Uh, it was this which kindled my zeal for the house of God and prompted me to undertake the defense of the city of God against the charges and misrepresentations of its assailants. This work was in my hands for several years, owing to the interruptions occasioned by many other affairs which had a prior claim on my attention which I could not defer. However, this great undertaking was at last completed in 22 books. Of these, the first five refute the, those who fancy that the polytheistic worship is necessary in order to secure worldly prosperity and that all these overwhelming calamities have befallen us in consequence of its prohibition. In the following five books, I address myself to those who admit that such calamities have at all times attended and will at all times attend the human race, and that they will constantly recur in forms more or less dis disastrous, very annoying the scenes, occasions, and persons on whom they light, will have many of this maintain that the worship of the gods is advantageous to the life to come. In these ten books, I then refute these two opinions, which are as groundless as they are antagonistic to the Christian religion. But no one might have the, but no one might have the occasion to say, that though I had refuted the tenets of other men, I had omitted to establish my own, I had devote to this object the second part of this work, which comprises twelve books, although I could not have scrupled as occasion offered either to advance my own opinions in the first ten books, or to demolish the arguments of my opponents in the last twelve. By these twelve books, the first four contain an account of the origin of these two cities, the city of God and the city of the world. The second four treat of the history of their the progress, the third or less were their deserved destinies. And so, though... All of these 24 books refer to both cities, yet I have named them after the better city and called them the city of God. Such is the account given by Augustine himself of the occasion and plan of this his greatest work. But in addition to this explicit information, we learn from the correspondence of Augustine that it was due to the importunity of his friend Marcellianus that the defense of Christianity extended beyond the limits of a few letters. Shortly before the fall of Rome, Marcellianus had sent to Africa by the emperor Heronius to arrange a settlement of the differences between the donut. Donatists and the Catholics. This brought him into contact not only with Augustine, but Volusian, the proconsul of Africa, and a man of rare intelligence and candor. Finding that Volusius, though yet as a pagan, took an interest in the Christian religion, Marsilius sent his heart on converting him to the true faith. The details of the subsequent significant intercourse between the learned and courtly bishop and the two imperial statesmen are unfortunately almost entirely lost to us, but the impression conveyed by the extent correspondence and uh, correspondence is that Marsilius was the means of bringing his two friends into communication with, each, with one another. The first overture was on Augustine's part in the shape of a simple and manly request that Volusian would carefully peruse the scriptures accompanied by a frank offer to do his best to solve any difficulties that might arise from such a course of inquiry. 
Pelusin accordingly enters into correspondence with Augustine in order to illustrate the kind of difficulties experienced by men in his position. He gives some graphic notes of a conversation in which he had recently taken part at a gathering of some of his friends. The difficulty to which most weight is attached in this letter is the apparent impossibility of believing in the incarnation. But a letter in which but a letter which Marcellinus immediately dispatched to Augustine urged him to reply of illusion at large brought the intelligence to the difficulties and objections to Christianity were thus merely limited out of a courteous regard to the preciousness of the bishop's time and the vast number of his engagements. This letter, in short, brought out the important fact that a removal of speculative doubts did not suffice for the conversion of such men as Volusian, whose life was one with the life of the empire. There are difficulties rather political, historical, and social. They could not see how the reception of the rule, they could not see how the reception of the Christian rule of life was compatible with the interests of Rome as the mistress of the world. And thus Augustine was led to take a more distinct and wider view of the whole relation which Christianity bore to the old state of things, moral, political, philosophical, and religious, and was gradually drawn on to undertake the elaborate work now presented to the English reader, and which may now more appropriately and which may more appropriately than any other of his writings be called his masterpiece or life work. It began the very year of Marcellinus' death, AD 413, it was issued in detailed portions from time to time until its completion in the year 426. It thus occupied the maturest years of Augustine's life from his 59th to his 72nd year. From this brief sketch, it will be seen that, through, that though the accompanying work is essentially an apology, the apologetic of Augustine can be no mere rehabilitation of something threadbare. If not, if at arguments of justice and truth, in fact, as Augustine considered what was required him to expound the Christian faith and justify it to enlighten men to distinguish it from and show its, and show its superiority to all those forms of truth, philosophical or popular, which were then striving for the master, or at least for the standing room, to be set before the world's eye a vision of glory that might win the regard even of men who are dazzled by the fascinating splendor of a worldwide empire, recognized that a task was laid before him to which even his powers might prove unequal, a task which certainly would afford ample scope for his learning, dialectical, dialectical, philosophical grasp, and accurate eloquence and faculty of exposition. But it is this but is the occasion of the great apology, which invested at once with grandeur and vitality. Okay, I have to pause real quick. Okay, I'm unpausing this. So I'm going to start this big paragraph. But it was the occasion of this great apology which invested <coughs> sorry at once with grandeur and vitality. After more than eleven hundred years of steady and triumphant progress, Rome had been taken and sacked. It is difficult for us to appreciate, impossible to overestimate the shock which was thus communicated from center to circumference of the whole known world. It was generally believed not only by the heathen, but also by most of the um, many of the most liberal-minded of the Christians, that the destruction of Rome would be the prelude to the destruction of the world. Even Jerum, who, uh, who might have been supposed to be embittered against the proud mistress of the world by her, by her inhospitality to himself, cannot conceal his profound emotion on hearing of her fall. A terrible rumor, he says, reaches me from the west, telling me of Rome besieged, bought for gold, besieged again, life and, pro uh, life and property perishing together. My voice falters, sobs, I full the words I dictate, for she is a captive, that city which enthralled the world. Augustine is never so theatrical as Jerome in the expression of his feeling, but he is equally explicit in lamenting the fall of Rome as a great calamity, while he does not scruple to ascribe her recent disgrace to the profligate and manners, the effeminacy, and the pride of her citizens. He is not without hope that by a return to the simple, hearty, and honorable mode of life which characterized the early Romans, she may still be, she, she may still be restored to much of her former prosperity. But as Augustine contemplates the ruins of Rome's greatness and feels in common with all the world at this crisis, the instability of the strongest governments, the insufficiency of the most authoritative statesmanship, there hovers over these ruins the splendid vision of the city of God coming down out of heaven, adorned as a bride for her husband. The old social system is crumbling away on all sides, but in its place he seems to see a pure Christendom rising. He sees that human history and human destiny are not wholly identified with the history of any earthly power, not though as it as it may be as cosmopolitan as the empire of Rome. He directs the attention of men to the fact that there is another kingdom on earth, a kingdom which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He teaches men to take profounder views of history and shows them how, from the first, from the first, a city of God or a community of God's people has lived alongside of the kingdoms of this world in their glory. It has been silently increasing. Presit occulto velut arbor avio. 
Is it, can we get a Latin translation of that? I'll put that into Google Translate. He demonstrates that the superior morality, the true doctrine. Okay, well, uh, Google Translate. It grows in secret like a tree from time to time. I'm going to go back to uh, here. He demonstrates the he demonstrates that this superior morality, the true doctrine, the heavenly origin of the city, ensure its success. And over against this, he depicts the silly or contradictory theorizings of the pagan philosophers and unhinged morals of the people, and puts it to all candid men to say whether in the presence of so manifestly sufficient a cause for Rome's downfall, there is room for impugning it to the spread of Christianity. He traces the antagonism of these two gray end communities of rational creatures back to their first divergence in the fall of angels and down to the consummation of all things in the last judgment and the eternal destination of the good and evil. In other words, the city of God is the first real effort to produce a philosophy of history to exhibit historical events in connection with their true causes and in their real sequence. This plan of work is not only a great conception, but is accompanied with many practical advantages, the chief of which is that it admits and even requires the full treatment of those doctrines or faith that are more directly historical, the doctrines of creation, the fall, the incarnation, the connection between the Old and New Testaments, and the doctrine of the last things. The effect produced by this great work, it is impossible to determine with accuracy. Bugat, with an absoluteness which should now condemn as presumption and any less comp competent authority, declares that its effect can only have been very slight. Perhaps this effect would be silent and slow, telling first upon cultivated minds and only indirectly upon the people. Certainly its effect must have been weakened by the interrupted manner of its publication. It is an easier task to estimate its intrinsic value. But on this also, patristic and literary authorities widely differ. Dupin admits that it is very pleasant reading owing to the surprising merit is owing to the surprising variety of matters which are introduced to illustrate and forward the argument, but censures the author for discussing very useless questions and for adducing reasons which could satisfy no one who is not already convinced. Hua also speaks of the book as Un Amas Kama. Okay, we gotta translate that. Right, come on. A confused heap of excellent materials, its golden bars and ingots. Lay uh, censors those opinions as unjust and cites with approbation the unqualified eulogy of Prentice. But probably the popularity of the book is its best justification. The population, popularity may be measured by the circumstance that between the year six, that between the year 1467 and the end of the 15th century, no fewer than 20 editions were called for that it is to say a fresh edition every 18th months. In the interesting series of letters that passed between Ludo, Vicus, Fives, and Erasmus, who engaged him to write a commentary on the City of God for his edition of Augustine's works, we find Vives pleading for a separate edition of this work on the plea that of all the writings of Augustine, it was almost the only one read by patristic students, and might therefore naturally be expected to have a much wider circulation. Now, who was Erasmus? That's my question. I know there's an Erasmus program in the European Union. Erasmus. Was a Dutch philosopher and Catholic theologian who is considered one of the greatest scholars of the Northern Renaissance. My dad has a picture of Erasmus. Uh, and then you have the Erasmus program. Is a European Union student exchange program established in 1987. Erasmus Plus, or Erasmus Plus, is the new program combining all the EU's current themes for education, training, youth, and sport, which started in January 2014. This is the Erasmus program. School. Who had engaged him to write a commentary of the city of God? Okay. If it were asked what, if it were asked what this popularity is due, we should be disposed to attribute mainly to the great variety of ideas, opinions, and facts that are here brought before the reader's mind. Its importance as a contribution to the history of opinion cannot be overrated. We find in it not only indications or explicit announcement of the author's own views upon almost every important topic which occupied his thoughts, but also a compendious exhibition of the ideas which powerfully influenced the life at that age. So this becomes his becomes a. Wait, let me uh. 
Google Translate copy. Still Google Translate open here. As the fifth and century, as the fifth century encyclopedia, all that is valuable, together with much, indeed, that is not so in the original in the religion and philosophy of the classical nations of antiquity, is reviewed. And some branches of these subjects it has, in the judgment of one well qualified to judge, preserved more than the whole surviving Latin literature. It is true that we are sometimes wearied by the too elaborate refutations of opinions which to our mind seem self-evident absurdities, but if these opinions were actually prevalent in the 5th century, the historical inquirer will not quarrel with the form in which this information was conveyed, nor will commit the absurdity of attributing to Augustine the foolishness of, the, of these opinions, but rather the credit of exploding them. That Augustine is a well-informed and impartial critic is evidenced by the courteousness and candor with which he uniformly displays to his opponents by the respect he won from the heathens themselves and by his own earthly life. The most rigorous criticism has found him at fault regarding matters affecting only in some very rare instances which can be easily accounted for. His learning was not his learning would not indeed stand in comparison with what is accounted such as an art and his life was too busy, too devoted to the poor, and is spiritually necessitous to admit of any extraordinary acquisition. He had access to no literature but the Latin, or at least he had suffered only sufficient Greek to enable him to refer to Greek authors at some points of importance, not enough to enable him to read the writings with ease and pleasure. But he had a profound knowledge of his own time, and a familiar acquaintance not only with Latin poets, but with many other authors, some of whose writings are now lost to us, save the fragments preserved through his quotations. But the interest attached to the city of God is not really historical. It is the earnestness and ability which with he develops his own philosophical and theological views, which gradually fascinate the reader and make him see why the world has set this among the few greatest books of all time. The fundamental lines of the Augustine theology are laid down here in a comprehensive and interesting form. Never was thought so abstract expressed in a language so popular. He handles metaphysical problems with the unembarrassed ease of Plato, with all of Cicero's accuracy and acuteness and more than Cicero's profundity. He is never more at home than when exposed to the uh, incompetency of Neoplatonism or demonstrating the harmony of Christian doctrine and true philosophy. And though there are in the city of God, as in all ancient books, things that seem to us childish and barren, there are also the most surprised anticipations of modern speculation. There is an earnest grappling with those problems which are continually be open because they underlie minds because they underlie man's relation to God and the spiritual world. The problems which are not peculiar to any one century. As we read these animated discussions, the fourteen centuries fall away between us and the Afric Saint, and at his side we urge today the immortal quest and no complaint. No outward sign to us is given from earth from sea or earth comes no reply. Hushed as the worm Hushed as the warm Numidian heaven, he vainly questioned bends our frozen sky. It is true, the style of the book is not at all that could be desired. There are passages which can, which can possess an interest only to the antiquarian. There are others with nothing to redeem them but the glow of their eloquence. There are many repetitions. There is the occasional use of arguments. Uh, this is plus inquine quex solidus. Okay, what does that mean? More ingenious than solid. As M. Sala says, Augustine's great admirer Erasmus does not scruple to call him a writer, uh, wait, dark, subtle, and a little too pleasant, but the toil of penetrating the apparent obscurities will be rewarded by finding a rich wealth of insight and enlightenment. Some who have read the opening chapters of the City of God may have considered it would be a waste of time to proceed, but no one, we are persuaded, ever regret reading it at all. The book has its faults, but it effectively, but it effectually introduces us to the most influential of theologians, and the greatest popular teacher to a genius that cannot nod from many lines together to a reasoner whose dialect is more formidable, more keen and sifting than that of Socrates or Aquinas to a saint whose ardent and genuine devotional light feeling bursts up through the se severest augment argumentation to a man whose kindliness and wit, universal sympathies and breadth of intelligence lend piquancy and vitality to the most abstract dissertation. The proprietary of publishing a translation of O Choice, a specimen of ancient literature, needs no defense. As Poja very sensibly works, there is not a great many men nowadays who read a work in Latin of 22 books. Perhaps there are still fewer who ought to do so. Uh, perhaps there are still fewer who ought to do so. With our busy neighbors in France, this work has been a prime fare for 400 years. There may it be said to be eight independent translations of it into the French tongue, though some of these are in part merely revisions. One of these translations has gone through as many as four editions. The most recent is that which forms part of the Nisard series, but best so far as we have seen is that of the accomplished professor of philosophy in the College of France, Emily Amélie Cesset. This translation is indeed all that can be desired. Here and there, an omission occurs, 
and about one or two renderings a difference of opinion may exist, but the exceeding felicity and spirit of the whole show and it is of the whole show it to be a labor of love, the fond homage of a discipline, the fond homage of a disciple proud of his master, the preface of M. Salet, is one of the most valuable contributions ever made to the understanding of Augustine's philosophy. Of English translations, there has been an unaccountable poverty. Only one exists and so exceptionally bad, so unlike the racy transition so unlike the racy translations of the seventeenth century in general, so inaccurate and so frequently unintelligible that it is not impossible to, it may have done something towards getting the English public a taste, a distaste for the book itself. That the present translation also might be improved, we know. That many men were fitter for the task on the score of scholarship, we are very sensible. That any one would have executed it with intenser affection and veneration for the author, we are not prepared to admit. A few notes have been added where it appeared to be necessary. Some are original, some from the Benedictine Augustine, and the rest from the elaborate commentary of Vives. Marcus Dodds, Glasgow, 1871. On the back of title pages to volumes 1 and 2 of the Edinburgh edition, Dr. Dodds indicates his associates and the work of the translation and annotation as follows. Books IV, XVII, and XVIII have been translated by the Reverend George Wilson, Glenn Luce. Books V, VI, VII, and VIII by the Reverend J.J. J. Smith. And then they have some footnotes here. Um, so that's that. I'm going to pause now.